Body on frame, go anywhere SUVs are a hot commodity these days, despite a very low selection. So today I'm going to drive two excellent yet polar opposite examples of such vehicles to help you and myself decide which one is the best. Now, if you just clicked on this video to express your deep hatred for Ford in the comments section, I want you to listen to me for just one minute. So the, you're already typing, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, Okay, jokes aside, even if you are a Toyota stan like myself, it's hard to ignore the effort that Ford put into the latest Bronco. Just like the 4Runner, it's not a cheap SUV, but if you can pull off the miraculous task of finding an entry-level spec at MSRP, the Bronco is going to undercut the much more well-equipped 4Runner SR5. Notably, the Toyota is now easy to find at or below the sticker price, but the Ford has much more flavors. It's like comparing the dizzying menu of Applebee's to Five Guys. You have many different trims that are more bare bones, to street focus, to really off-road focus, to even more off-road focus, to do you seriously need this? Whereas the 4Runner, you have one body style, one powertrain, and enough trims to fit a few different tastes. While the 4Runner next to me is a 2023, this one is actually a personal owner's 2021 Badlands trim with 35 inch tires, like what you would get with the Sasquatch package. I also did review this one when it's bone stock. All they've done since 2021 is add different packages. While adding features like fog lights into the metal bumpers, subwoofers into the base sound system, and responding to markups. Did they start penalizing dealers? Yes, but they also just inflated the MSRP by several thousands of dollars pretty much across the board. Now both of these trucks will have plenty of ground clearance so long as you don't go with the Ford's low spec models. Each comes with great off-road angles, though the Bronco does easily win there. You're gonna have actually standard underbody protection with the Toyota, something that most trims of the Bronco will also get. But they're available on all trims with varying levels of protection. You'll probably use proximity entry more often, and that's standard on both. And each will have LED headlights, though the Bronco does get more flashy LED daytime running lights. You'll get a metal front bumper in certain trims. If you're trying to maneuver these things off-road, the Bronco and the 4Runner do offer 360 view cameras, though admittedly the Ford has better resolution. And I should also mention the Bronco's amenities largely come in the form of low, mid, and luxury packages that you throw onto those various trims. Now, since the Toyota has a fixed roof, it's much easier to load a rooftop tent on it. Simultaneously, down the road, there's a lot less chance that it's going to leak. And the doors feel solid. Moving over to the Bronco, it has to make some obvious compromises to be a convertible. You get frameless windows, which make the doors easier to store. But at the same time, when you open the door, it kind of wiggles a little bit, and there's a lot more noise on the highway. Though I like that Ford mounts the mirrors on the front of the vehicle instead of on the doors, so when you remove them, you still have your mirrors. And the process of taking them off is super easy. Stripping the Bronco takes like 10 minutes on your own. You don't have power tailgates on these things. However, if you go with the soft top Bronco, you have a very unrefined prop rod situation in order to fully open the rear hatch, something that can be simply alleviated through installing hydraulics, like my dad did, because this is his Bronco. He has also added some other little cosmetic and functional touches. The Forerunner does have a party piece back there in the name of an electronic sliding glass. Style-wise, I think these are both well executed. The crisp and boxy Forerunner has aged extremely well in my opinion, and the bronze wheels of the 40th anniversary edition make it pop. I don't hate the decals either. The Bronco rocks a modern, retro aesthetic with a nice attention to detail. It makes you feel cooler than you really are. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section. Looking at the cargo areas between these two, the Forerunner also takes a clear win. While this is still very spacious, and even if you go with the two-door, it's not horrible, the Forerunner is just a complete box. While this is more of a diss to the new Sequoia, it actually has more cargo space with the rear seats folded down than Toyota's new full-size SUV. You also can equip it with a third row if your passengers are willing to use it. Plus, this has a 40-20-40 split rear row. That way you can take three other people on your way to the Home Depot or the slopes. Since it doesn't need to withstand the elements, the interior of the Forerunner is also 
just a nicer place to be. While far from luxurious, this thing has a lot of soft touch materials, including where my outboard knee is going to rest, it's nice and plush where my elbows rest. Even though the floor feels kind of high, these seats have great support for me at six foot three, and the electronic lumbar adjustment is standard too. While there are a lot of hard touch plastics, they also avoid using glossy finishes where you're actually going to touch them. You have giant physical controls for everything, including these comically large buttons. And one of my favorite parts of this is this big clunky gated shifter. It feels like you're moving a hammer, and sometimes I would really like to hit this infotainment screen with a hammer. It's just dated. It doesn't have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but I will admit it does do the basics just fine, and the average person looking at one of these vehicles probably isn't too concerned with tech anyway. So long as it's still working in 20 years, and Toyota has a good record for that. I do enjoy the look of the fully analog gauge cluster, and I also appreciate how solid this interior feels. There are no creaks and rattles. Storage in here is also excellent. You have many cubbies in the door pockets, cup holders that have removable inserts, so that way you can fit large 40 ounce hydro flasks in there if you want to. While it may not feel opulent, if you want a vehicle that has the build quality of an old Lexus, the 4Runner just about does it, but do not come here for the tech. And the back seat, while not crazy on headroom, has good legroom and still very plush seats, so this would be a pretty good road trip vehicle if you needed it to be. The interior of the Bronco is comparatively more spicy and focused, and that comes with some inherent drawbacks. So first off, given that you can remove the doors in the top, this really needs to use materials that can take a beating. So I think Ford chose the right stuff. We do have a lot of hard touch plastic, but there's varying textures. And I like that depending on which trim you go, you'll get some different colored accents. Some specs will even have vinyl floors that you can hose out. And there's little drain plugs too. There's also a bunch of these Bronco bolts so that you can interchange different accessories. I also like these little nets that they put in the doors. It'll fit a 40 ounce hydro flask nicely. And there's even Molly panels on the backs of the seats. Storage outside of that is okay. We're also going to see a lot of rubberized material and honestly, there are so many different small helpful features that I'm just not going to be able to go over all of them. But in summary, this is more well thought out for specific purposes. The flip side from all of what I just talked about is that it feels cheap. Now where this does get a leg up over the Toyota is in the touch screens. So you'll be able to choose from an eight inch infotainment or a 12 inch unit like what this has. Both of them have better resolutions, better response times than the Toyotas, and they can get bright. They have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and the UI is pretty easy to understand. The gauge cluster is also half digital and less intuitive. Where the Toyota obliterates the Ford is with the sound system. The Bronco does not have a roof cross member in the center, allowing for a unique open top experience, but that also means the speaker placement is especially weak. Even with the Bang & Oliphant system, the bass stereo in the 4Runner is more crisp and punchy despite lacking a real subwoofer. Similar to the Toyota, you have physical controls for just about everything. But the Bronco goes further through adding auxiliary toggles on many packages that come with pre-run wiring around the truck, making it easy-ish to add aftermarket equipment without worrying about adding switches to your interior. As far as comfort goes, these seats have very mild bolstering, they're supportive, you can get lumbar adjustment on them and they should fit a wide variety of people with good comfort and the elbow rests are reasonably soft. I also have plenty of knee room. Moving into the back seat, it's a little bit more cramped but still accommodable for taller people. And the middle seat is also usable. You can get various charging ports back there too, but no rear console vents like the Yoda. On the road, the Toyota 4Runner is old school in a charming way. Under the hood, we'll find Toyota's 2GR 4 liter V6 that has been in service for quite some time. It makes 270 horsepower, 278 pound-feet of torque. I've actually gotten zero to 60 in under eight seconds. It's the sole transmission, the five-speed automatic, that really chokes out the four liter. I mean, this thing hits like 70 miles per hour in second. It's geared so tall. The plus side is that when you're cruising on the highway, it's not really revving very high, but it does make this engine feel more wheezy than it really is. The transmission doesn't hunt for gears, but you really have to lay into the throttle at times to get the transmission to downshift in the next gear. Some people help it out by installing powertrain tuning devices. Now over rough roads, the 4Runner excels. It is softly sprung, and you do feel most imperfections, but hardly anything sends a shock through the cab 
love it. It has a bouncy truck disposition without much of the jittery ride quality found in many other body on frame vehicles. If you live around poorly kept roads, the 4Runner is a great companion. And it's also worthy to mention how solid it feels. I'm not hearing any noises that I shouldn't be. Where the 4Runner is least happy is around uh, some tight corners. <laughs> it's got a lot of body roll. This is a truck-based SUV with a high center of gravity and a soft suspension. If you want this thing to handle better, I would recommend getting like, you know, a King's Off-Road racing suspension or something like that. That will also help alleviate some of the brake dive, which this has a ton of. But as long as you're not really hustling this thing around corners, you won't make your passing, you won't make most passengers nauseous. Now, if you do want something with a little less body motion all around, Toyota does offer the x Riaz suspension, which is basically a hydraulically cross-linked suspension. And that really does make a difference. You'll find that on the TRD Sport and Limited. There's also no sacrifice in comfort, though it tends to be less robust and more expensive to replace than the standard shocks. The TRD Pro gets a completely reworked suspension with Fox off-road racing shocks and rear remote reservoirs to take maximum abuse. The steering on the other hand, uh, especially at lower speeds, is heavy and it's also slow. I mean, it just feels like a clumsy SUV, though it doesn't feel disconnected. It's appropriate for this kind of vehicle. Around town, it's manageable, but the wide turning circle and large steering wheel give the 4Runner some pirate ship characteristics. Now, sitting at 65 miles per hour, I mean, this thing is shaped like a brick and it does have big tires, so both tire and wind noise are present but far from overbearing and very easy to live with. So I would call the highway experience overall pleasant for an off-roader, but it's also an off-roader. So what kind of equipment do we have there? Well, you're going to have rear wheel drive as standard. A part-time four wheel drive system is optional and that's what most four runners are going to have. Though you can also get on the limited trim only a selectable full-time four wheel drive system. That actually uses a Torsen LSD in the center that is lockable. A system like that allows you to get four wheel drive traction without worrying about binding the system if the road surface isn't slippery enough. On the TRD Off-Road and Pro, you'll have a rear locking differential. Standard with four wheel drive is Toyota's A-Track, which is a off-road traction control, basically uses the brakes to help divert torque side to side, like a lot of modern crossovers do. But when paired with low range gearing, a true locking center diff, and available rear locker, it makes the 4Runner incredibly capable, almost as much as a well-equipped Bronco. One of the most rare off-road features that you can get on this thing is KDSS, which is more of a sway bar loosener than it is a disconnect. Basically, it takes thicker sway bars that help reduce body roll, but then automatically unlocks them when needed. And notably increase your articulation. Again, that's a very hard feature to find. And the last off-road feature to talk about is crawl control, which operates kind of similar to the A-Track system, but it adds in an off-road cruise and can even help dig you out of sand pits. It's way more than a gimmick. And while the windshield isn't giant or anything, the belt line is pretty reasonable. The pillars aren't too thick. So this is a pretty easy truck to see out of. Comparatively seeing out of the Bronco, you do have a long hood, but it's very easy to see See the end of it especially with the little trail sights and you have a low belt line though it feels wider and therefore maybe a little bit less approachable to the average person behind the wheel the bronco has some inescapable flaws but is surprisingly engaging to drive especially with the seven speed manual transmission so you have six normal gears but then a special crawl ratio so the 2.3 liter turbocharged engine that this transmission is exclusively mated to has better leverage, which means that even here with just 300 horsepower on premium gas, this has plenty of passing power. It's also pretty easy to shift smooth, and the throws with the stock shifter feel almost car-like. The clutch is also pretty numb, but it's easy to feather and get used to, and it also has a medium travel to it, so the transmission doesn't beat you over the face with a truck-like experience. The manual transmission also has a little hill hold feature which is nice and easy, and I think a slight anti-stall, so it'll give it a little bit of gas as you're starting out to keep you from looking incompetent. You can also get a 10-speed automatic transmission. I found that to do a great job at selecting the right gear and at shifting smooth. Honestly, smoother than the 5-speed and the 4Runner, especially when it's being hustled. And if you really want more torque, you can get the 2.7-liter twin-turbocharged V6, though I think for most people, the 2.3 should be fine. Zero to 60 with this comes up in about eight seconds. No, it's not a great 
great second shift there. But it will be a little bit slower with larger tires and a heavier spec. And there's also different final drive ratios. So there's a lot of variables. Bringing it up to 65 miles per hour, you can still hold conversations in here if you want to. The hardtop should be more quiet. And this isn't horrible, especially considering this has 35 inch tires but it's not great either. Wind and tire noise are prevalent, making it a bearable, but much more noisy highway companion. Getting it onto a bad road, it definitely feels truck-like and firmer than the 4Runner. And I think it's uh, maybe a little bit more controlled and less bouncy, though that comes at the cost of maybe a 10% difference in comfort. If I'm to add numbers to my glute sensors here, but honestly, either one of these, you should be happy around a bad road. Though the Bronco, there's just more going on. You hear the top kind of jittering in certain places. It's just a much less refined experience. It's also worth noting that this has independent front suspension just like the Bronco, which also helps give it more car-like steering when compared to something like the Wrangler. Now, one of the biggest surprises with the Bronco is how well it handles. Even with these larger tires, this has quicker, more accurate, less ponderous steering than the 4Runner. It's still numb and it doesn't feel any more connected than the Toyota, but it's very easy to change direction and the more rugged Bilstein suspension system that this thing has still allows this to have pretty controlled body motion. And the steering also is much lighter at low speeds. It also has a tighter turning circle too. It's really just an easier vehicle to maneuver. Keep in mind, this is all relative to body on frame SUVs. If you're looking for off-road features, you came to the right place as the Bronco comes with more of them. It comes with four wheel drive is standard. It has some off-road modes to help maximize traction. A rear locker is available. If you get the Sasquatch package, that's just going to be a blanket of rugged amenities. So you'll have the larger tires, an upgraded suspension with Bilstein position sensitive dampeners, automatic four-wheel drive, which can be used on a wider variety of surfaces than regular four high, the front and rear locking differentials. Some of those things will come in other trims like the Badlands, which has the front and rear lockers, but the Badlands also gets a front sway bar disconnect, which you can activate on the fly. It's very cool and helpful. You can actually get trail turn assist, which will break the inside rear wheel to give you a much tighter turning circle off-road. Not to mention the stupendous ground clearance of the Sasquatch models with the giant tires and the great off-road angles. The Bronco out the box is just going to be more capable. On top of that, you don't have to, you know, chop away at your fenders to fit 35-inch tires on here, though your tie rods may become more of a question as you jump up further in size, but that's something too that you can go through the aftermarket and upgrade. So as far as off-road versatility goes, the Bronco is going to take the edge, but there's also plenty of support for the 4Runner too, and it's more than capable out the box. Now, gas mileage probably shouldn't be your priority because neither of them are that good, especially if you're getting a more aggressive outfit of Bronco. And if you're planning on towing something, the 4Runner does take an edge, though neither are something that I would recommend towing another car with. Each of these are still high-tech vehicles with adaptive cruise control and a lane departure prevention. If you really want a bare bones vehicle without all that stuff, you have very limited options these days, but neither of these will come with lane centering and the 4Runner will have you opt into blind spot monitoring. Now, the thing that seems to be the main subject in all of my Bronco videos is reliability. There were definitely some problems in the first model year, but th that's something that not even Toyota is clean of. But I'm not even going to question which one I would recommend if you highly prioritize reliability. Now with the Bronco, the biggest thing that people talked about initially was the bad batch of 2.7 liter EcoBoost V6s that were dropping valves and destroying engines. The 2.3 has been reliable outside of rare reports of a turbo wastegate failure. Ford has addressed windshield problems and tried to fix hardtop leaking and peeling issues, but some still complain about those. Wonky wiper motors and a dangerous brake booster have been reported, and broken tie rods aren't entirely uncommon with larger wheels if you're bashing it off-road. After 25,000 miles, this Bronco has had no issues outside of the capless gas tank throwing a temporary code. For a new model, this isn't half bad, and I wouldn't be afraid to buy one if reliability is a concern. If it's one of your highest priorities, the 4Runner is the clear choice. Outside of some supposed 
supposedly resolved issues with the fuel pump, lock actuators, and rear diff groaning, the 5th gen is remarkably problem free. It also has port injection, unlike the 2.3 EcoBoost, which only has direct, so there's a little less maintenance too, as the intake valves will be continuously cleaned with the Toyota. Frame rust with the 4Runner isn't like it used to be. With either, I'd highly recommend coating with fluid film at least once a year before winter. Now here's a plot twist, my dad's Bronco here actually replaced a 2019 Toyota 4Runner. Now I did ask my father why he jumped from the 4Runner to the Bronco, and his answer was pretty simple. He wanted a new vehicle with a manual transmission, it's something that probably not going to be able to buy here soon, and the 5-speed and the 4Runner was again lackluster, but he was also smitten with the idea of being able to remove the doors and the tops, which he does very regularly, they're off most of the time in the summer, and he was in love with how it looked. And while he does say he misses the refinement of the 4Runner and the slidey glass, if given the chance to go back and change things, he would still buy the Bronco, and he's had a great time with it. And yes, he's had it well past the honeymoon period. But honestly, making the decision for myself, which one I would rather have, it's not so simple. The Bronco has more personality and is driven by a purpose. It's an off-road vehicle before anything else. The 4Runner finds a much more reasonable balance between road manners and goat activities. But honestly, every person that took a ride with me mentioned the 4Runner's unkillable reputation. Even non-car bros. The initial and long-term quality of the 4Runner is legendary and far superior to most cars, let alone one that's designed to be taken apart. The Ford is a master of thoughtful details for its target audience, and features additional wild cards in the form of a manual transmission and crossover-like steering. For most, especially those buying an automatic or folks who aren't going to regularly take off the doors, the 4Runner earns the crown, but the Bronco puts up an impressive fight. For the enthusiasts, the Ford adds enough fun to the mix to compensate for the refinement. For me, after some dark hours of contemplation, I'm going to have to narrowly choose the 4Runner. Runner. Even though my heart lies with the Bronco, I love the manual transmission, the steering, the style, the details, and personally, I think it will offer respectable longevity too, but the 4Runner feels like a tank. It's much more quiet and buttoned down, and for how I would actually drive this thing, those are much more important to me. Plus, I don't think my off-road needs would ever surpass that of an Outback, let alone flirt with a 4Runner's limits. Let me know which one you guys would go with. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like to help me flex on the maniacal YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more fun, detailed car content without fluff. Check out my Patreon for an additional podcast, and I'll catch you in the next one.